I ignored my destiny once. I cannot do that again. Even for you. I'm the only one who knows that. At least I'm the only one with the will to act on it. The Mad Titan Podcast with your host, Jay Washington. What's happening, everybody? I'm back. It's the 97th episode of the Mad Titan Podcast. I'm the Jay Washington. My apologies for not having an episode up last week. I tried to get one going, man, but every time I tried to get one to record, I ended up having to do a million and seven things in front of this damn computer, and um, they took over a lot of time. Let's just get this out the way. I'm by myself this week, so I'm going to run through this. Everything I got, uh, people have been busy, and I get it, so it's hard to have a guest this week. But I told y'all, I, I'm, I'm trying to hold firm to my commitment of no matter what, I want to keep getting episodes out to y'all and make sure, you know what I'm saying, y'all getting the best that I can give you. And I don't want to sit there and have y'all waiting multiple weeks between episodes. So if I got to, like I said before, if I got to do it myself solo, I'm going to do it myself solo. Plus, um, I was going to try to record yesterday on Sunday. It's Monday and I'm dropping it the same day. Uh, I was going to try to record on Sunday, but uh, the Oscars happened. And uh, yeah, y'all already know what that is. And I'll save all that discussion. Um, I'll save that discussion for further in depth for when we get to Blurred in the Hood uh, this week. So I I highly advise y'all to check out Tuesday's episode whenever you hear this. So check out Tuesday's episode of Blurts in the Hood if you can watch it live or if you can catch the clips when we put it on YouTube, all that good shit. But uh, nonetheless, I digress. I'm happy for everybody who is here, everybody who want to rock with your boy. And for those who may be new, um, let me say this, for those who are new to the podcast, who have not heard it before, who've heard about it, who don't understand uh, what this is, I get you caught up on all the day, all the things happening in the Marvel and DC live action cinematic universes. This is barbershop talk for nerds. So I might say some shit that might get you in your feelings. I might say some shit you're not going to agree with. You're going to be like, how are you this wrong? And then I'm going to tell you, I don't give a shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to keep it. I, I always keep my perspective open. And uh, I keep my perspective open. And I try to make sure I back up everything I say with fact. Um, so there is no mis construing anything I could say like I have a lot of people who will have different opinions on what I say and many of those tend to email me at the Mad Titan Podcast email which is Podcast at gmail.com what they call a hotline and we have those discussions here on the show this is what I do I've always been this guy who um, I'm going to have an opinion on something and it may not always be the opinion you like or you want to hear. And that's fair. But the thing is, the opinion is going to be backed up by a lot of fact, if you will. It's not just going to be opinion as stated. It's going to be a formulated opinion based upon fact. I just want to say that shit. So I always kick things off with my Marvel news. And in the first, in the first bit of Marvel news I got for today, it is March 28th. As I record this, on the 1st of April, Morbius will hit theaters. And the early reviews have already come out from Morbius. And they have said what I think many of us already kind of knew what it was going to be, even though hoping for the best. They have stated that it is a train wreck. (laughs) That is an absolute train wreck. They have stated basically this movie is bad, it's confusing, it goes all different types of ways and places. It has no real sense of direction um it's woof. it's stated to be a bad one now it's set it's expected to debut with a 50 million dollar opening weekend despite its uh criticisms and whatnot um i'm gonna tell you some of the responses that have been said on this like first of all i was one of those people when they announced the cast in the jared leto i was like uh no Let's not do this. I definitely said that, right? Then I saw the trailer, and I'll admit, I was like, okay, I might be kind of into this. But I still was skeptical and hesitant, and this is not the case. So there was a screening in London, and the first reactions were revealed. 
And so the vast majority of them came out. So this is from, these are some of the reviews that uh, were released and given out, if you will. So Sab Astley on Twitter said, well, Morbius is about as bad as you was thinking. A 2005 collides with a plot, colli- a 2005 plot, excuse me, collides with a visually confusing CGI to create a bit of a snooze fest. But don't worry, they've saved the worst for last. Feature some of the worst post credit scenes you've ever seen. Sony are off their rocker. Uh, Escape Film Club said Morbius proves that no matter how many famous faces or shiny visuals you squeeze in, Sony will always find a way to impressively misunderstand basic storytelling. Damn. Uh, Nicola, Aust- Nicola Austin says, well, Morbius is unfortunately not great. Some real shoddy visual effects in 2000s formulaic plot and definitely not as fun as Ven- Venom. Really confusing, confused at the future of the Sony Spider-Verse following the post credit scenes and the editing. Matt Smith is clearly having a blast, though. Says in Morbius, Matt Smith gloriously hams up the place and Oliver Wood delivers some visual flair to the action sequences. Aside from that, the bad plotting, a mass- messy CGI, confusing editing, and worse, the sound mix result in absolute incoherence. Uh, Post credit scenes managed to outdo it all. The uh, it, This is just like getting worse and worse as I keep reading it. You got uh, post credit sequences. It's clear. It's clear to see where Sony is going with this, but the thought process behind it, behind making them actually make sense, is non-existent. Morbius walks a fine tightrope between gothic vampire melodrama and comic book fantasy. Jared Leto embodies Michael Morbius with a dedication no actor could. The pacing is brisk and it features some great visual flair. And that's a positive one from Neil Vag. Now, again, I didn't expect much of anything from this i'm not gonna lie i didn't expect this to be a i didn't expect this to be a a hit you know i i honestly figured that sony would just say look the formula we use with venom worked uh it it generated a billion at the box office venom 2 kind of fell off a wee bit but you know this is what they're gonna do cheesy campy style even though we know that We've seen what superhero, the superhero genre can evolve to be. And I'm not just talking Marvel and DC. I'm talking the boys. I'm talking even animation with Invincible and so on and so forth. You know, granted, Jupiter's legacy was rushed so quick into trying to cram everything and then make it incoherent. Um, it shows you what it can be, potentially. Now, I know Jupiter's legacy probably wasn't the best example, but this shit was on my heart. All right. This shit was on my heart. So Cinema Blend actually uh, did a Q&A with Morbius director Daniel Espinosa, and he even gave a few spoilers in it. And if you don't want to hear spoilers, I mean, some people probably don't care. You know, this is it's been open to everywhere. So, I mean, you can't pretty much ignore him. So Cinema Blend asked him what universe is Morbius take place is. And he said Morbius lives in the same universe as Venom. This is the universe we saw Venom at the end of Venom Let There Be Carnage and the return to at the end of Venom, at the end of Spider-Man, let, let Spider-Man Nowhere Home, excuse me. Uh, he said, is there a Spider-Man in Venom's universe? Espinosa said, of course. So Cinema Blend said, okay, which Spider-Man exists in Venom universe? And this is what Espinosa said, and here's where it gets confusing. He said, it is my understanding that audiences will, still, will discover the answer soon. Okay. Uh, he said, let's shift. To, so Cinema Blend went and said, let's shift to Michael Keaton, who we saw in your Morbius trailers. Is he playing the same Adrian Toomes, a.k.a. the Vulture from Spider-Man Homecoming? Espinosa said, yes. And then Cinema Blend followed up, was like, well, how did he get to the Venom and Morbius universe? Espinosa followed up again and said, at the end of Venom, let there be carnage in Spider-Man No Way Home and in No Way Home itself. It's clearly established that it is possible to trans- possible for characters to transfer from one multiverse to another. The events of No Way Home had the effect of transferring Venom and Vulture and maybe others back and forth between the MCU and the Venomverse. That is the most confusing shit ever. That is by far the most confusing shit ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah they can go back and forth, but... Like, is he there? Like, yeah, we know why they went back and forth. It wasn't like there's just open portals. There was a spell that opened up one, and then there was a spell that sent them back. That is confusing. Okay. Uh, one of the final questions that said uh, from Cinema Blend, is Vulture, is Vulture in Morbius setting up for a Sinister Six movie? It says, well, he is recruiting teammates, and he has enticed one already. So it sure looks like a start. Hey, yay, yay. 
Ay, ay, ay. Well, you know what? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Now, I know it's kind of, for many people, it's like, how do you spoil a movie before it comes out? But it's kind of what it did. I mean, when they dropped this interview that quick, this is what the director wanted. So, ugh. Ugh. I don't know, man. I'm just not. Look, I would like to give anything a, a, a try, a, a fair shake, if you will. I want certain things to succeed and excel. But sometimes it's just not meant for certain things to, to succeed or excel. It just is what it is. So that may be, may be the case with Morbius. Am I potentially judging it too harsh? Yeah, but I'm going to judge it just as harsh as I judge anything else. Why wouldn't I? Yeah, I mean, I said this to somebody. To, uh, to me, this is supposed to be Jared Leto's redemption for playing the Joker. Now, a lot of people didn't like his Joker. Some people say it wasn't given enough chance to stretch his legs from what was in the original Suicide Squad. And I kind of agree. But also, here's the thing. If a lot of a character's arc and plot or whatever are left on the cutting room floor... Sometimes there's a reason for it. Sometimes there's a reason. And to sit there and sit for people who are going to go, well, the nightmare scene in Dude's Justice League to help justify him. And it's like it didn't. It was just unnecessary. It was just to throw him in there just to for fan service. That's, you know, I feel that way as, as well as many others. So, nonetheless. Uh, this week also we get Moon Knight. Uh, Moon Knight is, is debuting on Disney+. Plus and a lot of people have seen the premiere uh, first four episodes and so on, and a lot of people have said it is it is definitely up there. It's dope. It is its own thing, its own entity. Um, the way it sets up itself and going forward, it works. Now, there's a potentiality, like I've stated before on here and from other places, this could be setting up the Were Werewolf by Night uh, Halloween special that we are getting for Disney+. Plus. Again, they said it won't be called Werewolf by Night, but you know that's pretty much what it is. But here's something that kind of has a crossover touch of a story. And when I say crossover, I mean crossover universes. And I'm not talking about MCU to other uh, Sony and Marvel universes. Moon Knight director Muhammad da Daib, I believe it is. Please excuse me if I'm saying it wrong. Says that Wonder, Woman's 19, Wonder Woman 1984's Egypt set scenes were a quote unquote disgrace. He explained why he considered the set sequence a disgrace by those from the country, liking it to look like something from the Middle Ages. Now, this was a recent interview that he did. He had already expressed his disappointment in Black Adam that it will make use of Egyptian iconography, but not feature actors from the country due to its fictional setting of Kandak. And the filmmaker acknowledged that the movie not taking place in Egypt uh, explained the lack of authenticity, authenticity excuse me, on screen. And he was less impressed with Wonder Woman 84. He said, quote, in my pitch, there was a big part about Egypt and how inauthentically it has been portrayed throughout Hollywood's history. He said, it's always exotic. We call it Orientalism. It dehumanizes us. We're always naked. We're always sexy. We're always bad. We're always over the top. He said, you never see Cairo. You always see Jordan shot for Cairo, Morocco shot for Cairo, sometimes Spain shot for Cairo, and this really angers us. I remember seeing Wonder Woman 1984, and there was a big sequence in Egypt, and it was a disgrace for us. You had a sheik. That doesn't make any sense to us. Egypt looked like a country for the Middle Ages. It looked like the desert. So what he's saying is that I've not been to Egypt. Some of my listeners, you may have been able to travel. And I've, I've heard this, that like a lot of film and TV take these other countries and they I want to say dumb them down. You know, they, they, they make them look dilapidated and things of the sorts. And like, yo, they're, they're fucking metropolitan cities you know it's just what we hear what the news gives us and all that stuff and so that's that shit but when asked how moon knight succeeds in that regard to how egypt is portrayed he said it's part of the show because it's part of the comic book it's part of how he gets his powers it's ingrained in it there was definitely room to play but kept it as authentic as possible in the realm of being fan fantastical even in the original comic books, they get a great job of researching and trying to make Egypt authentic. I want to see that because, again, 
the, it is an essential part of the character of the lore. And I, you know, I just feel like, look, as a black dude, I'm always, I'm the one, I'm one of those people that are like, yo, representation matters, right? No matter what. And now that we're getting more representation than which we usually have gotten, and we're getting it above and beyond, why shouldn't we, um, why shouldn't we see the actual depictions of, of cities and towns? Of course, we'll love to see, people love to go to see uh, Dubai in the Middle East because it's this big metropolitan city, this beautiful, all this money, these skyscrapers, et cetera, et cetera. But show the cities for what they are. It, I don't think it's, you know, sometimes, yes, I understand it's about getting filming permits and international relations, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think you're doing any justice by envisioning what a city is when a city is there. If you're going to make a false city, yes, I understand that. When you make a metropolis, a Gotham, um, you know, most of the cities in D.C. and even Wakanda, for example, um, in D.C. comics and Wakanda, for example, excuse me, you, you, you have to visualize what would this city be like? What would you describe it as? That's why Gotham is always portrayed to be a kind of a dark-esque Chicago, New York, sometimes London's backdrop works for it. Um, Metropolis is any busy major city. Any busy major city. Uh, Wakanda was an African country that just had is super technologically advanced. So for when it comes to Egypt and Cairo, like do your research, do your homework, give it the best representation possible because you are representing those people. You are representing those of that area, of that country, that city, that culture. So just want to make sure I put that out there and live my, live my thoughts to that. Now, I saw this, and this one kind of had me shook up. So She-Hulk supposedly is, quote, unquote, not shaping up to be very good. And this is due to creative issues. Now, there's some rumblings. There's rumblings of how it may not be good. Now, this is coming from somebody I know, okay? This is somebody I know. I've, I've worked with this person several times for, for a while. Um, they've been pretty accurate on some things and other things. Of course, they've, they've raised eyebrows. I'll it go. I'm not going to mince words about it. So it's from Jeff Snyder. OK, this is what Jeff said on his podcast. Now, he writes for the Ankler currently, and he said there are issues with she hoax she hoped that are concerned, causing concern, excuse me, in the hallowed halls of Marvel Studios. This is what he said on his podcast, quote. I've heard not good things behind the scenes and I've asked whether it's Moon Knight or Miss Marvel or Secret Invasion or any of these projects. And they always are like, she Hulk is the one that could be a problem. I've heard from people working on it, from people actually working on it who are like, we'll see. I think it's a lot of Marvel things. And honestly, you know where it's just like, ugh, this can be really stupid. Like, we'll see. He said, I'm sure people making Guardians of the Galaxy felt that way, right? And most of the time, Marvel pulls it off. But there will come a time when they won't. And that's just the laws of movie, movie making, the laws of numbers. Now, Eternals round up being Marvel Studios' first rotten movie, right? Okay, it can happen. It, it can happen. So I'm not saying that every MCU movie is fresh in the Rotten Tomatoes' eyes or good or perfect or whatever the case may be. I understand that movies, everything can't be a hit. Everything can't be a hit. It's just, it, it is what it is. Everything, look, there are people who love the Eternals. I don't have a problem with the Eternals, but then there are people who don't like it. That's fair. But creatively, when things are being made, you're going to hear different things. Um, I do I do agree with Jeff when he mentions Guardians of the Galaxy, because I will always go back to the conversations I had with people in general uh, that the average person even the average comic book fan did not know who the Guardians of the Galaxy were. So this was a weird ass thing that James Gunn was making. And the odds were like, yo, will people receive this? And as we know, you fell in love with a talking raccoon and a talking tree. So anything's possible. Anything's possible. I just don't know. I mean, again, Tatiana Maslany looks amazing as She-Hulk. You know, they did a great job from what I've seen. I cannot be mad at it at all, but we just got to see how this plays uh, plays out going forward. Again, we'll be getting She-Hulk a little bit later this year, so you know, 
Fingers crossed, right? Right? I guess. Uh, let's move on. Now, the role in Secret in- for in Secret Invasion for Amelia Clark has really been under wraps. People didn't know who she was playing. Uh, they didn't know what she was doing. Now, a lot of speculation was that she was Abigail Brand. But some set videos that have come out would basically give revelation to who she is, that she's working with the Scroll Invaders. And she's said to be playing Princess Varenki. Now, in the comics, Varenki is a member of the Dar- the Dardarvan. It's a deeply religious sect of Scroll society who prophesies the end of the Scroll Empire. And after being exiled as a zealot by then ruler Dork V, Vi, she eventually took his place to the Skull Empress and orchestrated the secret invasion. Now, this is accurate, and the show sticks to source material. Then there is a chance that Clark will be posing as Jessica Drew, also known as Spider Woman on Earth. Now, the plot details are still under wraps. We know it focuses on the basic premise of that comic book, y'all, of an infiltration of scroll, scrolls on Earth. We'll find out they've been here, all this. You know, they've been here for a while. And remember, in Spider-Man Far From Home, we found out that Talos had been, um, he had been around here posing as Nick Fury through the whole movie. So while Fury was building Sword out in space. So all of these different things are happening now. We don't know exactly how far it goes, you know. And sometimes having plot details stay under wraps are good. I'm going to say that. While I'm trying to read notes and everything and, and do this, I'm going to say this. Having plot details under wraps are good. Not having everything revealed in trailers is good. Not knowing every key element of a project, a show, a movie is good. Like, why do we feel we need to know everything? We don't. We don't. Like, yo, sometimes you got to just have, wait for the surprise. Wait for the oh, damn, I didn't know that was going to happen. Or, wow, they're playing this person. You don't have to know who it is. You know the essential characters. And, yes, you get some big names cast in roles that haven't been divulged. Let that be. I I never understand this new age of wanting to know every single thing that's going to happen beforehand. Whatever happens to having the element of surprise. And yes, I understand spoilers and I, I get what I talked about with Morbius earlier. There are certain things you want to spoil us. There are certain things you be like, okay, cool. But I think when it came to Morbius, people wanted to know, yo, what universe is this shit in? Because I am Venom. Okay, it's in a Venom world. But then that Spider-Man, what? Who? It gets confusing. You know, seeing the murderer on the Spider-Man part and you're like, wait. Is that referencing Tom Holland's Spider-Man? But also, here's the thing about that scene, too, and I keep forgetting to bring this up. Trailers don't always reflect what's exactly in the movie. There are scenes that are brought in trailers that are cut out from the actual film. And sometimes there are scenes in trailers that are reshot to be in the film, so we never fully know. So, you know, I I just wanted to make sure I put that out there. I, I just want to put that out there. Um, let's move on to my next bit of news. As soon as my notes come up, I'm sitting there trying to do this for two screens. I keep telling y'all, I feel like a, a kid with a new toy. I finally having two screens at my disposal for, uh, my computer. It makes it so much freaking better. Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn says more than one character is going to make their MCU debut in the Guardians holiday special. Now, he took to Twitter, as James Gunn does, to give more details on the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. He said it sounds like it's going to be a Disney one shot and it's going to welcome a couple new faces. Now, last year, he stated one of the greatest MCU characters of all time and in his quote unquote incredibly subjective and admittedly often odd opinion. He said revealed that there's more than one new great MC character being introduced. Now, a lot of people are believing that it's going to be Nova, of course, but it may not. So this is what he did say. Now, he kept from dropping any hints as to who exactly it was going to be, which I love that, right? But this is what he said. So, uh, excuse me, he said, quote, James Gunn said, quote, I did say it, but I'm prone to hyperbole and usually think the current thing I'm working on is the best thing I've ever done. That said, I really do love it. I think people are going to be happy with this Christmas with what we're creating, the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. He's called it one of the greatest things he's ever done, and he says that a lot about different things. So my question to y'all is who do you think is coming up, coming in? Do you think Nova is being introduced in the holiday special or Volume 3? Because don't forget, we still got Guardians Volume 3 happening. It's just he's giving us a Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special. 
So which one do you think that's going to be? Who else do you think we're getting that we haven't gotten yet? I remember everybody thought in WandaVision we may get uh, Adam Brashear, a.k.a. Blue Marvel. I wouldn't be surprised if James Gunn puts him in this weird-ass world somehow, some way, whether, you know, the Guardians end back up on Earth and have an interaction with him. Um, there's so many characters. But for me, it's there's so many characters, right? And there's so much Marvel Studios is doing with who they have in development projects for and whatnot, where you're like, I, I don't know. I don't, who could be introduced in this that we haven't had introduced already? Because again, there's a bunch of people set to show up in all these different things. And we're talking the Guardians holiday special. So I'm thinking in that regard, like who would fit best in the, the holiday motif, however they want to run it. But I don't, we don't know if that's, Ooh, excuse me, pardon me. Ooh, I've been working all day. We don't know if that's part of that or going into Guardians 3. So, again, just wait and see. We'll figure it out. All right, let's move on to some DC news. In my DC news, I talked about it earlier. Uh, the Oscars were yesterday. I am recording on Monday. And, hmm. So, the Oscars decided to do a thing. They've been doing this for the past couple of years. They've been trying to have this idea to make an offshoot category where basically a Marvel movie can win, right? Because if Marvel wins, that's Disney winning, and the Oscars are owned by ABC, Disney, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the fan favorite that won the fan favorite vote for a moment was the Flash entering the Speed Force. That is not a real moment. All that was is dudes, fans, trying to be like, see, see how popular this is? You high, let them hijack. You gave them a reason to hijack a contest. And the fan favorite film that everybody thought was probably going to be Spider-Man No Way Home or at the, at the current point in time was Cinderella ended up being dudes, Army of the Dead. And again, no one was fans of the movie. They're fans of the director. And so they... I, I guarantee the Oscars will not make this mistake again because they call themselves opening the door to do something different, right? And in the process, they screwed themselves. They screwed themselves. Um, I, I And I say also because we're tired of hearing the restore the blank verse. We're tired of hearing it because it's not going to happen. And I know some people are listening to this and going, well, Jay, you were one of the ones who said the Snyder Cut wasn't going to happen and it didn't exist and it did and blah, 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 blah. And I've openly stated this. Yes, I said that. But also, I know why they brought it up. I know why they made it happen. Because Warner Brothers, more so AT&T, more subscribers for HBO Max. Do not mention to me streaming numbers. People keep saying, well, it was the biggest streaming... They didn't care about streaming numbers. They wanted subscriber numbers. Streaming numbers don't bring more money. Subscribers bring more money. So with that, that fan base felt emboldened. They still do. And to this day, they think now with this whole Warner Brothers Discovery thing, that Discovery is going to say, oh, fire them and go ahead and finish this. Which I don't know if y'all, again, I really don't think these Snyder fans know how movies work. I really don't. You really are saying that everybody's going to drop what they're doing and just go back and do this. Zack Snyder's going to want to deal with this. This is not going to be the way you think it is. It's just not. So, whatever. Um, what else is that I want to bring out? Yeah. So, real quick before I get into these other stories. The CW shows have been renewed. Now, The Flash has been renewed um, as of right now. But... Batwoman and Legends of, Legends of Tomorrow have not been renewed yet. And a lot of people are wondering what's going to happen with those shows. Well, Legends of Tomorrow, again, they keep changing cast members, but that has always been a thing of the show. But it seems like we're losing more and more of the core cast. Um, Batwoman, I have thoughts on Batwoman, and I'll just say them. That's what this is for. I always said that Batwoman was supposed to, after the Ruby Rose fiasco, Batwoman wasn't supposed to survive, right? So Javicia comes on board 
and you weren't just going to not give her just one season. You were going to give her at least two. It was There was a thing. She was always going to get two seasons as Batwoman, at least. Now, granted, I have not watched it in recent. I will admit that. I have heard from some people it's gotten good. But the question is, are the ratings overall reflective of that? And I know when we talk about ratings, when it comes to the CW shows, when it comes to the Arrowverse shows, it's a very weird way to judge them or how they are judged. I don't know what to say. So we'll see what happens with that. The Gotham Knights series is still uh, going. The pilot has been adding cast members. So Supernatural's Misha Clark, Misha Collins, excuse me, is set to join as Harvey Dent, a.k.a. Two-Face. He is going to join that. And there's also just been another new addition today. Uh, where is it? There it goes. Yeah, I just had it right here. Duh, I didn't have to reopen it. I felt stupid. Um, Anna Lore has joined Gotham Knights as well. And she is from All American. Now, she's going to play Stephanie Brown, one of the leads. She's been cast in a recasting role. So somebody was recasted, but the person who was originally cast had not been announced. So a lot of the cast members are set for this pilot. We don't know if it's going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's being written by the Batwoman trio. And so it picks up in the aftermath of Bruce Wayne's murder. So we just got to... See what happens. Okay, what else do I have? Uh, James Gunn, some more James Gunn news. He has officially confirmed that Christopher Smith, a.k.a. Peacemaker, is indeed bisexual. Now, this is what happens. He told Total Film, it was me and John talking about who he is. Peacemaker is a hypersexual guy that led him to be set a sexual omnivore in a lot of ways. I think it's interesting because Adebayo is so traditionally liberal in so many ways, but sexually... Adebayo is incredibly conservative. I mean, she's married to one woman. They have a monogamous my lifestyle. And Peacemaker is sexually incre Peacemaker sexually is incredibly liberal. He's a hedonist. That's just who the guy is. Well, if you remember, even uh, his father, Augie, you know what I'm saying, played by Robert Patrick, and when they were fighting, I think it was in the uh, penultimate episode, he said when he was... Uh, Talking about him as a failure and talking about how he was unclean. He said he slept with the whores of polluted blood and men. So we knew that Peacemaker fucked people. But also, I just need to know, is he ramrodding a dude while screaming freedom? That's all I really need to fucking know. I mean, again, I don't care about Peacemaker sexuality. I don't think it's a big deal. I don't. I mean, we see that it's just probably a little tidbit. But I know there's some people who are going to just run with this and make this a big deal. And I understand, again... I understand about representation. I understand that. I'm going to always say that. I get it. I'm here for it. But let's not act like Peacemaker was a character nobody cared about. Anybody cared about. Let's not act like that. Let's not act like Peacemaker was this dude. Everybody was like, yo, have you read the latest Peacemaker issue? Shut the fuck up. No, you haven't. Um, all right. So I think the last bit of DC news I have. So they released a deleted scene from the Batman that showed Batman talking to the Joker played by Barry Kehogan, uh, Kehogan in Arkham. And he reaches out to the Joker to try to get some insight into the mind of the Riddler. It's about a five, six minute scene. We see that Joker's full face, how horribly grotesque he is, his figure. He looks like a burn victim. Of course, it's everybody's different take. Um, I personally didn't like it. Again, personal opinion. I didn't care for it because I never thought <clears throat> I'm fine that the Joker is out the way already. I'm fine with he's already caught the Joker. Joker's in, in Arkham. You know what I'm saying? Things like that. I'm cool with that. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. But I just him reaching out to the Joker for advice or how to catch another psychopath. Just don't seem like something for me. I'm really good with. I don't know. I, again, maybe I'm. I get. Yeah, you use the mind of a madman to catch a madman type theory. I, I get if you're going there. I just. I see why I was cut from the movie. I do. I just think it wouldn't have fit in the long scheme of the regular movie. And of course, like I said, the Batman is a movie that some people love, some people don't. And at the end of the day, that's okay. 
I think we got to always remember that. At the end of the day, it is perfectly fine if someone didn't like a movie, they don't like a scene. I don't care what comic book franchise it is. Let me make sure I state that because there are too many people, especially in on the Bird app and social media in general, trying to go, oh, well, just because it's DC and you're a Marvel fan and, or Marvel fan and you, or you're a, a DC fan and you don't like Marvel, it, there's none of that doesn't matter. Some people may have their implicit biases. Yes, I get it. I get it all the way through. But at the same time, some people just don't. So, again, I, you know, Matt Reeves is signed on, if I'm not mistaken, for two more films. Uh, the next one, if I'm also not mistaken, is supposed to be Mr. Freeze. So I would like to see, a, I can't wait to see a grounded take on Mr. Freeze. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, that's all I got in news for the day, man. Let's go ahead and get to some of these emails I got from the Mad Titan Podcast email at madtitanpodcast at gmail.com, madtitanpodcast at gmail.com. You can also call the hotline, 818-276-6947, 818-276-6947. I only got one email in here. Let me make sure uh, I'm looking at this right. I got to probably reset my computer because I got a lot going and my computer is acting kind of slow on me today, but I digress. All right, we did that last week. We ain't got nothing in the spams. Do we got in the spams? I know I got the one email here. Let's just do this one email. Let's let's click on that in this way. Yeah, y'all hearing this live? It is what it is. It says, listen to question, and it's from the lovely Jolene. Jolene says, hey, Jay, love you, love your show, and you know this. And I get that you love BC, but he and I are fake enemies because he said a mean thing about Legends of Tomorrow, LOL. It's perfect and super queer, and how dare BC? Fake rant over. <laughs> but question time. He's probably not the one on the show you read he's not probably he's probably not one the show you read this but the thing that confused me is questioning the melodrama he's probably not going to be the one on the show that's what i'm okay that's what i'm getting he's probably not going to be on the one on the show when you read this but the thing that confused me is the melodrama in super questioning the melodrama in cw superhero shows like y'all know it's a core principle of comic books right like so much drama between the hero and their friends is always messy emotional drama like can you imagine an x-men show where wolverine isn't an overly dramatic jerk that he <laughs> annoyed that he can't fuck this woman married to his best friend they're soap operas and finally being filmed as such is like perfect for me sorry it's not for everyone have a great day i agree i agree a lot of the core in a lot of superheroes is definitely emotional drama whether it be relationships family uh, a whole bunch of other things i think we've you have it where some people want to see outside of that and some films some of the comic book films have given us just the action part of the superhero genre yeah we get some of, we get some of the emotional core we absolutely do but for the most part we're getting the, the flashy lights the bright bangs if you will and the CW is not going to give you all that, A, because of its budget. Let's just be real. But also, it's the CW. You know, I think people got to watch these shows on the CW and just know what to expect when you're watching. Don't watch those shows and start thinking, oh, man, I'm going to get this big explosions and boom and all this major gigantic action sequence going all the way through and all these big set pieces, et cetera, et cetera. No, you're going to get things that are core and grounded and built to things. Arrow is one of my favorite shows, and it is an emotional mess all the way through. And that's in the best way possible, me saying that. Even when the seasons that I feel fell off, season three, season four, uh, there's still emotional things in, behind them. You know, the, the, the love with magic and Damian Dark and all that, and then the Ra's al Ghul and the, league, and the League, all those different things. So I get it. There's, yes, uh, Legends has pushed the pedal to the metal when it comes to its love and its melodrama and whatnot, because it's decided to say, yeah, some of these characters are in DC lore. But for the most part, we're making our own show outside of that. That's what Legends of Tomorrow is and has become. It started out as, yes, these are DC characters. Some are obscure characters and we're putting them together on one show. And as the show has evolved, you're getting less of those characters and more of just regular people or people who are auxiliary to these characters and whatnot. And again, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of drama. Now Sarah Lance is pregnant. So it is what it is. But I get it. I've 
I've been a fan of CW shows. Again, Legends hasn't been renewed yet. I said this earlier. Nor has Bad Woman. Don't know what's going to happen with that. The Flash is set to go to its ninth season for sure. Now, I don't know why people are shocked about The Flash's announcement when Grant Gustin just signed a big new deal. Like, he's not going to sign a big deal and not be renewed for another season. I don't know, man. Anyway. That is all I have got for y'all today on this episode of the Mad Titan Podcast. I am so super grateful for you all. Thank you all for rocking with your boy. Um, did it solo again. As always, you all mean the world to me for listening to this, to listen to me rant and get my feelings out and, and say everything, how I feel about what I feel. And um, I'm just grateful to have you all rock on this journey with me. Before I go any further, let me go ahead and make sure I tell you all this. June 18th, Saturday, June 18th at 7 p.m., we are doing a live Blurds in the Hood here in Los Angeles in Hollywood at the Bourbon Room. Tickets will go on sale later this week. Uh, so I will let you guys know even on the next episode. I definitely will let you know on Blurds when it goes live, when the tickets go live for sale. But we would love for you all to come out. And be there with us. So we are not going to stream the live show live. Because we want y'all in the building. We want y'all to see what this madness is. And what we got in store for y'all here with us. So we want y'all here. So again, mark your calendars down. June 18th, the Bourbon Room in Los Angeles, California. It's in Hollywood, man. We're going to have a great time. And we want y'all in the building with us, all right? Y'all already know the drill. Follow me, Twitter, Instagram, at Mr. J. Washington, M-R-J-A-Y. You should know how to spell Washington. Everybody say it along with me, all right? Um, Birds in the Hood, as I said, Tuesday, Thursday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. on the East Coast. My, if you want to support the, if you want to support here, if you want to support the Mad Titan Podcast, please join my Patreon, my Supervillain Squad, patreon.com slash Mr. J. Washington, patreon.com slash Mr. J. Washington, which you will get. You're getting access to my Discord. We're currently working on a Blurs in the Hood Discord. Please bear with me with that. I'm trying to put all that together. But you are a producer. You become a producer of the Mad Titan Podcast. And if you decide to join my one-on-one -on -one with the Supervillains here, we sit down once a month to talk between 30, 45 minutes, maybe a little longer about whatever it is you want to talk about. And as I say in each and every one I do, these conversations are so amazing. They are so unique. They are different and they are fun. And I love having them with you all, all right? Uh, but thank you to my producers of the squad, the members of the Patreon, Alberto Rios. Thank you for being at the one-on-one tier. Brock Severson, Charles C. Wilson, thank you, bro, for being at the one-on-one tier. Cheryl Corman, I love you to death. Chris Lee, thank you for being at the one-on-one tier. Christopher Conley, Dan Vicky, David Adams, Davlin, Fanboy Cantina, Fillmore Pockets, Fred Castillo, Hillary Nellums, James Robbins, Jim Payne, thank you for being at that tier. Jolene, thank you for being at the tier. Justin Square, Kenneth Daisy, Christy Oliveria, Marcus Burton, Marlon, AZ Badfish, I appreciate you, Patrick Harden, Quentin and Milrow, Randy Constance, thank you for being at that one-on-one -on -one tier. Rudy Bueda, thank you. And Sol Govin, thank you all for being at the one-on-one -on -one tier with me uh, to support. I, it means the world. I, I say it all the time, and I could be, y'all think I could be bullshitting, but I mean it from the bottom of my freaking heart. I love y'all for this, and I'm so grateful to y'all. Uh, y'all make everything worthwhile, so I appreciate that. But, uh, yeah, I will holler at y'all next week. Till then, take care. Y'all know the drill. I'm out. Bye.